Good evening, my name is Jennifer. I am the library manager here at the downtown campus of FSCJ, and I want to thank you for coming out to our Fedora is Alive event. Um, we are celebrating this month in the library, Indiana June, so all month long we are featuring a variety of different archaeological facts and anthropological facts on our Facebook page, and we also have a display of books upstairs for those of you who are so fascinated by this topic when you get out of here tonight, you just can't stand the thought of going home without checking out a book. So be sure you come and visit us. Um, we have a poster at the front there where you can actually scan it with your phone with a QR code and automatically like our Facebook page, which we really want you to do because we're shameless self-promoters and that's the easiest way we have to get you guys to know what we're doing. Um, we are very grateful tonight to have Dr. Keith Lashley here for UNF. He's a graduate of the University of Florida, hopefully I'm getting all this right, and the coordinator of archaeological research at the University of North Florida, which I think most of you already know because I believe a lot of you are his students. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Ashley to stage. Thank you. I just want to show this really short movie clip. It's actually the introduction to kind of use it as a springboard to talk about a little bit about archaeology. I'm going to make this really pretty brief, uh, but I just want to hit a couple kind of key points. Uh, so let's just take a three minute. Uh, gander at this scene here, and you'll see it again once the movie starts, but I kind of want to use it as a springboard. After seeing that, the first thing I started to think that if the register of professional archaeologists said, okay, we've decided in addition to your degree, you have to pass this obstacle course, 95% of archaeologists would be dead. Okay, so don't think that this is an archaeologist. Uh, a couple things, I kind of want to use this as a springboard and hit a few kind of uh, bullet points, uh, things that I thought about when I was watching the movie. The first thing, he is totally, I'm not here to draw and quarter Indiana Jones, so I want to let everyone know that, but I just want to kind of relate it to what we do. Uh, first of all, there's this total fixation on the most valuable thing in there, probably the most economically valuable thing there that he can later we find out sell to the, to the museum. So that's all he's focused about. As an archaeologist, what we would do, it would probably take us you know, a year before we even got to the statue. We would start mapping everything. We would be really detailed about everything so we could have it all systematically gathered. Okay? Uh, in the end, he destroys the site. We destroy sites, but at least we have records of it. He basically swoops in, grabs what he needs, and then basically leaves the site a wreck. Uh, but there are just to me, I'm more interested in all these booby traps, all this intricate technology that's going on there. How did they get that boulder so round, and how did they get it up there? I mean, those are the things, kind of questions that we would be asking, not just going after this gold, gold idol. I totally understand that this is, this is fiction, uh, it's entertainment, uh, but they do kind of present him as a tenured archaeologist, so he should do at least a little archaeology, I think. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's, he's an adventure. A uh, couple other things. Um, I, I was watching, I put out a couple of these quotes. The government agent will call him, you have a reputation as the obtainer of rare antiquities. Uh, when he's talking to uh, the, the museum guy, he says, the ark represents everything we got into archaeology for in the first place. And then uh, Marcus Brody, who's with the museum, says to him, the museum will buy them as usual and pay the usual price. They'll pay you handsomely. In the original script, it said the museum will buy it as usual, pay you very well, no questions asked. Okay? They basically change that. They take out no questions asked and he garbles something about permits, but you never really catch what he what he is saying uh, there. So I think these really give us kind of insight into Indiana Jones kind of motive for doing archaeology. It really does seem to be really very uh, item relic uh, focused, usually the most you know, valuable high profile one uh, that's there. Uh, you know, so what is archaeology? For us, archaeology is kind of the study of the human past through the analysis of material remains. Okay, we are really interested in people but what we really study is people's stuff, their things. However, we use those things from mundane things, from broken pieces of pottery, to thrown away animal bones, to charred pieces of charcoal, you know, wood charcoal. 
We look at all these things to try to get to the people. We can't observe the actions that are going on. All of our informants are dead. We can't talk to them and ask them why they do certain things. So we have to rely on what preserves, the relationship of what preserves, the patterning of what preserves, to try to get at social relationships and things like that that we can't see. But there are patterns in the archeological records. So that's why it's really kind of mandatory for us to really take things really systematically and try to look at where they are and what they're in relationship to, which is not really exactly what Indy does. A couple things. I could stand here and kind of critique him from today, 2015, and find so many faults, but what about 1930s? This is set in the 1930s. So how does he kind of uh, stand against the standards of 1930s, okay? What we see in the 1930s, public interest in archeology span really is starting to grow, okay? And archeologists are starting to keep an eye on the public and on collectors and things like that. Archaeology is kind of moving through its evolution. They're really becoming interested in gathering facts about people and about the past. Okay? We start to see advancements for the first time in methodologies, okay, in excavation procedures. There's now going to be a concern for stratigraphy, the different layerings of earth and the things that are found there. They start to use this to measure time. The deeper that layer is, the older it is. The higher it is, the more recent it is. So we can look at this layer is older than this layer, which is older than that layer, and start looking at histories in this way. So there really is this concern for street geography. They're starting to excavate in that way. Okay, so we're really starting to things going on. So now they have some degree of control over time. And so they're starting to say, okay, we're gonna call these archeological cultures. And these archeological cultures are defined by certain diagnostic artifacts. These artifacts only occur in this level during this period of time, so that represents culture A. Over in this area, these are the artifacts they have. They may be the same time period, but they're different, so that's culture B. Then maybe culture C is below it and different culture you know, E is above it. They assign them local names, Beaker, uh, Belmont, whatever it might be. So this is what we're starting to see at this point in time, okay? So there is a concern for these types of things, okay? Uh, what we'll find out is that when they uh, talk about Indiana Jones and he works with Ravenwood, whatever, you, you, um, you, you uh, studied under him at the University of Chicago. In the 1930s, the University of Chicago is the university uh, in terms of archaeology. It's at the forefront. So you would think Indiana Jones being educated there would be using all these kind of cutting edge, state of the art 1930s types of things. Our main tool is a masonry trowel. I don't think I've ever seen him in any of his. Uh, movies have a, have a trial. Uh, so they're really trying to really, really stress precision and controlling and where things are, okay? So in Indiana Jones, kind of where is the archaeology? You get this silhouette kind of off in the distance and they're, they got their picks and they're kind of digging away. If we look at a scene that really looks somewhat like archaeology, it's more the Nazis and what they're doing with the French guy than what we see Indiana Jones doing. Uh, I think the only time you see him really uh, with a brush, he's just trying to brush away an edge so they can lift off like a tomb cover, okay? Uh, he gets down in there and they do find the ark, like he doesn't even care about, you know, the contained the ark soon. He just flips it off and goes for the ark. So again, I still think we start to see this. There's no mapping, there's no recording. A couple of times he'll write things down, but I think he's just writing down a couple of measurements for the staff. It's really not any type uh, of note taking or anything like that. Uh, really, his approach is a lot like just looting. It kind of sends this message. You go in there, you get what you need, you get out of there, you give it to the museum, and you know, everyone's, everyone's happy. Uh, so that's kind of its uh, diamond dash kind of archaeology. Uh, archaeologists do teach, okay? But I've never elicited the kind of response from students that he does. And my wife says, well, that's because you're not Harrison Ford. So and I can buy that. I'll, I'll admit that. Uh, so a lot of times... We just don't see that, but um, um, not all, all archaeologists teach. Um, the latest statistic that I looked at, that there are about 1,600 archaeologists who are affiliated with kind of universities, okay? There are maybe another uh, 1,000 to 1,200 that are somehow affiliated with uh, the government, some form of government. A lot of those are more administrators. Uh, there's a, probably another eight or 900 that are associated with states or with uh, Native American tribes. 
And then there's probably about 7,000 who are in kind of the private sector. So not all archaeology today is university affiliated. Uh, in the past it was, university, uh, university museum affiliated, uh, not so much now. I've never gotten an apple from a student. He gets an apple, he gets all kinds of great stuff. <laughs> Just a hint. Uh, who owns the past? This is a kind of a great question that we have uh, in archaeology today. I think up until the past couple of decades, I don't think archaeologists thought at all about ownership of antiquities or ownership of sites that are being excavated. Um, most archaeologists, particularly at this time, are from Western industrialized societies uh, whose kind of economic and political domination kind of gave them the automatic right to dig up these sites and collect these antiquities. So in a way, what he's doing is somewhat what was going on kind of in the 30s. But really since World War II, a lot of those colonies are now independent nation states. Uh, they have their own antiquities law. They have their own interests in their own heritage. Right now they want to do it themselves. Uh, so now it's not just an outsider coming into the country, grabbing a few relics, taking it back to the museum. Now what we see, it's basically those local countries doing their own archaeology in-house and keeping those materials in their local types of uh, uh, museums. You do see Americans getting permits, going in there, doing some excavation, and maybe they can now bring those artifacts back, but usually it's short-term, eventually goes back uh, to those countries. I think now we try to work with descendant communities or with native communities in doing archaeology with respect and cooperation. Uh, that's not really what's going on kind of in this scene. Uh, Indiana Jones, it, in the 30s, it probably was pretty male dominated. Okay? Uh, today, uh, I think the latest statistic I saw in anthropology, more graduate students are female than males. Probably now in archaeology, we're probably pretty close. Uh, women were around, women uh, were running uh, excavations, it was pretty rare. Uh, they usually were kind of relegated to laboratory work at the time, okay? Uh, you go in there, you can wash pots. That would be something that you can do that can contribute uh, to them. Uh, most people haven't heard of a Dorothy Garrard. Dorothy Garrard was a female from Cambridge University. She went to the Middle East with a series of other colleagues from Cambridge University who were all women. The Palestinian crew and the Palestinian overseers were almost all women as well. So there we see a site in the 1930s that's being excavated uh, by an all-woman crew, but you really don't see much uh, with it. Uh, at UNF, I think over the last 10 years, maybe longer, I would say that every field school, females have outnumbered males in our field schools. And that's going on this year right now. Uh, so it is now a profession in which women are a major part of as well. And contributing in all aspects of it, field work, publications, everything, not just washing things. Uh, blessing and a curse. It, it really is. I think at times we have a feeling of ambivalence you know, about him. Uh, the blessing, I think it did promote uh, interest in archaeology outside of academia, that the general public started thinking about archaeology or about the past and how interesting it is there. In terms of the academic world, I think the biggest contribution of Indiana Jones is that he was, he inspired a lot of aspiring archaeologists. A lot of kids would watch this and what we see a spike in the number of anthropology majors in archaeology in the mid 1980s into the early 1990s. And most of them when you ask them would say something, yeah I was really caught by that, that caught my attention, I was really drawn to that. You know, as they start studying, they realize they're gonna be scholars and not treasure hunters, but it provided that initial kind of spark. Uh, so that's a big thing I think that really has helped. Uh, we see this exact same thing happening right now in anthropology, but it's not archeology. span Over the past 15 years, what has it been? CSI, bones, it's forensics. Everyone now is going into forensics and they're finding out it's just not wearing all, you know, all the hip clothes and all that kind of stuff, that there's more to it than that. It doesn't take a day to get a DNA sample back either. So we see that going on. So it has really kind of contributed uh, in that way. Uh, the curse, it just it does do a, a Hollywood job on how archaeology really works. I think archaeologists sometimes get annoyed. They bristle sometimes at the mention of the word Indiana, Indiana Jones. 
Uh, it's just not how we do archaeology. It's uh, he's, a, he's a terrible archaeologist. I mean, he's a great adventurer. He's, you know, he's all the things you'd want, I guess, in an adventurer. But he's not a real good archaeologist, or at least he's not a good archaeological role model. Let's put it that way. Uh, so we don't see a mapping. I think sometimes we'd like to say, hey, we'd like just to see a little bit more archaeology, or at least a little more lip service to the importance kind of, of archaeology uh, in, in, his, in his adventures. Again, we've got to look at the context of it being you know, in, the, uh, in the 1930s. And I think sometimes we can overlook, at least I can, I can overlook some of these things as long as the movie is good. The movie is not good. <laughs> That's a better word, I should say. If it's not good, then we, we'll hit it harder. But sometimes you overlook these things. Uh, you do see it. people talk about uh, fedoras. You know, people people wear them now usually get mocked because they're they're copying him. But in the 30s, they were wearing these. Archaeologists do wear, you know, sometimes broom hats and stuff like that because we're out in the sun. Uh, I tend to wear a baseball cap, but uh, each his own. Real archaeology. Okay. Real archaeology is not a lone hero, you know, basically dashing into a tomb or into a hidden room with his pistol or her pistol drawn, whip in the other hand, and then re-emerging a little bit later with, with the most valuable relic that was in the room. Okay? It's a lot more than that. It's basically archaeologists, it's students right here, this row right here, those are UNF students who right now are out in the field uh, with it. Uh, Karen. Uh, a few years back, UNF student who was out there in the field. So a lot of what we do is really on the backs of students who are out there toiling in the hot sun with us, who are actually you know, screening tons of dirt, laying out grids, digging with precision, uh, doing all of these types of things. And, and the rule of thumb is, in archaeology, for every day you spend in the field, you probably spend three days in the lab. So if we're in the field for a month, we're in the lab for at least three to four months just analyzing and processing all the stuff uh, that kind of comes out of the ground. Because to us, it's just not gold statues. It's broken pieces of pottery. It's everything. I don't know what that is, but uh, it, was, it was an image. Uh, so uh, that's, the students are digging so fast that you can't really see it. And like, not just fast, effectively and efficiently. Um, but this, I think this image is basically showing them kind of digging and really digging very meticulously. Uh, and then when we're done, it's not just basically take everything, head back to the lab. We actually then uh, draw all the walls, we photograph the walls, we document everything. So while we have destroyed this part of the site, we've now removed everything, dismantled everything in an incredibly meticulous, systematic manner, and then we've documented every way possible. Okay, then we go back to the lab and we can analyze them in terms of their context so we know where they were in relationship to other things in the same level or things above or below them and then try to reconstruct the actual activities that occurred at this site a thousand years ago to produce the deposit we're now excavating. Okay. I think there were two lower ones. Oh, I guess we have lost them again. Oh no. Actually, this friend, Justin, this is you right here. I don't know why I didn't come in. The image here is basically Justin, I mean, not Justin, sorry, Jordan. Jordan right here, um, washing artifacts in front of him in the lab. Uh, I think Shoshana, you're probably in there as well in the background. Uh, Micah, Lee, everyone was there. So we go into the lab, we wash, we process them. Uh, that image did not show up. Uh, these did. Uh, so we go after everything in the ground, from broken pieces of pottery to shells to modified little, true little arrowheads to work pieces of, of bone to shells that are made into beads to fossilized shark's teeth that are also drilled and used as jewelry. So again, we are going after all aspects of material culture. Everything that preserves, we want. And it's really unfortunate that we're missing so much all the organic materials, all the perishable materials, all the textiles, woven materials, all of those usually don't preserve. Wood, a lot of times we don't get the wood unless we get kind of an anaerobic waterlogged condition or a dry cave condition. We're losing a lot because of preservation. Um, we go after animal bone. Even probably good archeologists in the 30s, 40s, and 50s probably didn't pay a lot of attention to the little bit of animal bones that were there. Uh, what was interesting 
in the 50s when they first started doing screening, where they take the dirt and throw it through a screen or sieve it to, to find the artifacts, they, they would collect uh, bones. But they would use screens that were like this big. So they'd say, oh, the only thing they're eating are really, really, really big fish and deer. That's because everything else was kind of falling through the screen. Now we use much smaller gauge mesh so we can capture all those small things so we can see that the fish that they are uh, capturing are juveniles or small school fishing or large school fishes. So we can actually look at seasonality, we can look at technology, we can look at so much more than just their subsistence. Um, this one here, uh, we collect these shells, what we're working right now. And so we collect all these oyster shells, uh, clam shells, whatever they might be. This is a quahog clam, which is this one right here. We just take our tile saw, just a regular tile saw. We'll cut it in half, polish it down, and we can then look at the actual cross section of the clam and determine the season of the year that it died because they put down these alternating opaque um, and translucent kind of rings. So based on which one's the outer one, how wide it is, we can say it's kind of a summer, it's a fall, it's a spring, whatever. So it lets us know when they're targeting uh, clams. Uh, for oysters, Indiana Jones never got a tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, impressed otostone. Uh, you see how tiny they are? These are tiny fish bone. These do provide valuable information to us. So we can look at these things, we can measure their size. These little things right here actually attach themselves to oysters. Okay, they're basically predators to the oyster. Okay, um, when the natives collect them here, they, they shuck, well, they don't not shuck them, they're uh, steaming them and opening them up. These little things will fall off, and these things live one year. So we can actually measure their size and look at their modal size distribution, and we can determine when they died. They died when the oyster was taken out of the water, so they become a proxy for oyster death. So then we can determine now, based on this, is looking at seasons of capture for, um, for oyster. So we can do it for clams, we can do it for oysters, we can do it for certain fish based on their size. So really, there's a lot more minutia and small things that we really look at. We focus on those small things forgotten, those things that people throw away or cast aside. Most of what I dig is people's garbage. I don't dig treasure. Uh, we find some great garbage, we really do. But we focus on that. We wanna find their garbage, we wanna find their houses, we wanna find their mundane, everyday life. Okay, so I think that ends my time. Yes, so um, I just enjoy the movie. Just basically keep in perspective that, you know, he's not really doing archaeology. All right, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Um, where can we see a dig in this area? I think there's something going on at the Fountain of Youth right now in St. Augustine. Oh no, we do it right here in Jacksonville. So every summer, a semester, the University of North Florida has a field school. And right now, all the students right there, we're working out in the hot sun today on Black Hammock Island. So we are currently on Black Hammock Island for this week and next week. Uh, we prior to that, for the four weeks prior to that, we were in the Fort Carolina digging in people's yards. And probably working on probably one of the best sites here in Jacksonville, thanks to 1000 AD, in which we're finding material that comes from far flung areas of Eastern North America. Wow. We have a UNF Archaeology Lab Facebook page. You can go there and watch, look at the students digging and stuff that's going on. And if anyone's ever interested in coming and joining us, just email me, kashley at unf.edu. You can come and join. We, uh, we frequently have uh, students from uh, FSCJ campuses who will come out, find out about, and come out and visit. You're welcome to take it for credit or visit just to see what it's like. So uh, we'll be out like, the rest of this week and next week. So just let me know if you want to come out.